Having completed our study of 1 Corinthians 15, we now today want to turn to a discussion of the Gospels with respect to the resurrection of Jesus. You'll remember that in the formula that Paul quotes in 1 Corinthians 15, 3-5, he enumerates the key events of Jesus' passion and resurrection. Christ died, was buried, was raised, and appeared. And we, in looking at the Gospels, want to take in order those last three elements in the formula. The burial of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the empty tomb account, and then finally the appearance narratives of the Gospels. Now, inasmuch most scholars think that the Gospel of Mark is the earliest of the four Gospels and was used as one of the sources by both Matthew and Luke, let's turn to the Gospel of Mark to begin our study of the resurrection narratives. First, let's talk about the burial account. Mark's burial account is found in Mark 15, verses 40 to 47. Mark 15, 40 to 47. Let's read that together. There were also women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph, and Salome, who, when he was in Galilee, followed him and ministered to him, and also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And Pilate wondered if he were already dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. And he bought a linen shroud, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud, and laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Now, a couple of features of this burial account are noteworthy. First and foremost is the person of Joseph of Arimathea. He appears nowhere else in the Gospels outside this burial account. And yet, the Gospels uh, universally attribute the burial of Jesus to this man, Joseph of Arimathea. He is described as a member of the Sanhedrin himself, uh, a council member, which had, you remember, condemned Jesus. Uh, in its trial. And he gives Jesus a proper burial in a tomb. Now, for Jews at this time, proper burial of the dead was of uh, supreme importance. Even criminals received proper burial. They believed that to uh, not bury a dead person would be to defile the land and bring uncleanness upon the land, and therefore it was very important that even criminal persons be properly interred. And a Sanhedrist would have the authority to take charge of the burial of Jesus. And so some have suggested that perhaps Joseph was simply the member of the council who had been assigned this duty to dispatch the bodies of the crucified victims properly and make sure that they were properly interred. But I think even in Mark's account, there are clues that Joseph has more than just an official interest in the corpse of Jesus, that there's a personal interest here on Joseph's part. For one thing, he shows a special concern for the corpse of Jesus. Remember, Jesus was crucified with two other malefactors. And Joseph apparently does nothing to uh, bury them. 
uh, he's apparently content to leave that up to the Roman authorities. But he singles out Jesus of Nazareth as someone that special attention should be given to. Moreover, the way Mark describes Joseph as someone who is looking for the kingdom of God is a description of the, the gospel that Mark presents. When Jesus comes on the scene in Mark 1, he is proclaiming the advent of the kingdom of God. And Joseph is said here to be looking for the kingdom of God, which suggests uh, his sympathy to uh, Christian concerns. Then also, notice that it says he dared to go in to Pilate and ask for the body of Jesus. Since he wasn't a family member, uh, it took some courage for him to approach the Roman authorities and to request Jesus' body. So I would think that there is a reason even in Mark's account to think that Joseph of Arimathea was at least a sympathizer uh, with Jesus and had a personal and special concern for taking care of Jesus' body in a proper way. Now notice that it said that Joseph wrapped the body in a linen shroud and then laid it in a tomb. Jews, unlike Egyptians, did not embalm their dead. And therefore, the dead were not wrapped like mummies. Uh, wrapping a dead corpse that has not been involved, uh, embalmed rather, would uh, cause the uh, gases released by a decaying and decomposing body to explode eventually, and the, the wrapped mummy would just burst open from this. And so what they did, rather, is to wrap the dead in some sort of a sheet, uh, which is described here as a linen shroud. It's very interesting to compare Jesus' burial with that of Lazarus. You remember when Lazarus uh, comes out of the tomb, he is uh, able to walk. Um, he's, he's not bound up like a mummy, but it says that he was bound hand and foot, and there was a cloth wrapped around his face. So probably what was done is that the, the wrists and the ankles were tied together, uh, a jawband was put around the head to keep the jaw from falling open, and then the whole thing was wrapped in a sheet uh, and packed with dry spices and other um, ointments in order to offset the stench of decay. Now, according to John chapter 19, Joseph was assisted by Nicodemus in the burial. Look at John chapter 19 and verse 39. John 19, 39. Nicodemus also, who had at first come to him by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. And then they together uh, inter the body of Jesus in the tomb. Nicodemus is mentioned only in the Gospel of John and only appears there um, in connection with the burial. He's not mentioned in uh, Mark's account or the other gospel accounts. Notice the type of tomb that is described here. In first century Israel, there were three kinds of tombs that were used. The first kind were so-called kokim tombs. And these were uh, tombs which featured um, niches perpendicularly carved into the stone, uh, forming, as it were, pigeonholes uh, into which the body could be inserted, and then it would decompose in there, uh, and the bones could later then be collected into an ossuary or bone box to be preserved until the resurrection. Now it's very evident from the description of the empty tomb that we'll read later that the tomb of Jesus was not a Kokim tomb, even though this is the most frequently used tomb uh, at that time. There were also um, Acrosolia tombs. 
And these tombs um, featured a sort of niche that was carved into the wall. And then the body could be placed um, on a shelf uh, that would be inside of this niche. Um, finally, there were bench tombs where you didn't have the niche, but you simply had a kind of shelf uh, or, or bench on which the body could be laid. And it's evident when you read the stories of the discovery of the empty tomb that the tomb that Jesus was interred in was either an acrosolia tomb or a bench tomb because the women see the young man or the angel seated at the um, end of the body, um, which indicates that there was room for a person to sit next to the corpse as it's laid out. Now what's interesting about this is that these kinds of tombs, compared to the more common Kokim tombs, were very expensive and therefore could only be um, afforded by people of uh, nobility or wealth. Moreover, the type of tomb that is described here have, had a disc-shaped uh, stone that could be rolled across the door of the tomb. These stones would roll down a sort of slanted groove until it covered the door of the tomb and then a smaller stone could be wedged against it, making it uh, very, very difficult for anyone to open the tomb back up again because the stone is so heavy. If you go to Israel today, uh, there is a tomb in the uh, park behind the King David Hotel in Jerusalem. It's the tomb of Herod's family, King Herod's family tomb. And this is a, a bona fide first century tomb, and it has still extant there the huge disc-shaped rolling stone uh, that you can see for yourself. And it is massive. It is just enormous. And you can see how difficult it would be for anyone to uh, reopen that tomb once it was closed. Now these rolling stone tombs are also very rare. There are only four extant from the first century that we know of today, and one of them is the tomb of King Herod's family. All of this goes to bear out the description of Joseph as uh, a respected member of the council, of the ruling elite in Jerusalem. In the other Gospels he's described as a rich man uh, and these details are borne out by the kind of tomb in which he inters Jesus. Any comments or questions on that uh, first feature of the narrative, the burial by Joseph of Arimathea? Cindy, we'll bring the mic to you. I don't think this question will enlighten us any further, but I was curious. If you had the type of tomb as he did, with the stone that rolled over it. Is it the type of tomb a family would have whereby if someone died and then years later the bones were collected and then someone else was placed in that tomb? That's my understanding. Now I'm not sure if the bones were actually kept in the same tomb where the corpses... But they would be put in the box, would right. they not? That's right. Okay. Yes, yeah, so that they wouldn't come into contact with each other. And then a new body, perhaps, right. could be placed there. Right, right. Yeah, as family members died, they could then be placed in this same tomb. Yes, right here. Was an explanation offered for this decision? Or is it simply stated that it occurred? There isn't any explanation given in the gospel accounts, and that is one of the reasons that this figure of Joseph of Arimathea is so mysterious. As I say, some people think that he is just an official delegate of the Sanhedrin, responsible for taking care of these corpses. Um, and they would say this may have been a sort of criminal's tomb in which he placed Jesus. But as I say, in Mark there are clues already that Joseph has a special personal interest in Jesus. 
And that's borne out by the later Gospels, where they, uh, two of them say that he was a secret disciple uh, of Jesus. Um, critical scholars will sometimes say, well, well, that's just an elaboration that the later Gospels make on Joseph. But what I'm suggesting is that you already see hints in Mark of that, and they may make it explicit, but in Mark already, his care for the body of Jesus, but neglecting the bodies of the two thieves, his daring to go to Pilate, the way in which he wraps Jesus in a linen shroud and, and lays him in the tomb suggests care, uh, and uh, not just this kind of cavalier attitude of throwing the corpse in there. All of these go to suggest, I think, that indeed Joseph is, as I say, at least a sympathizer of Jesus. Well, now a second feature of the narrative that I want to draw attention to is the women who play a role. The women are mentioned in three places, at the cross, then at the burial, and then at the discovery of the empty tomb. In Mark chapter 15, verses 40 and 41, as we read, he lists the women who were at the uh, crucifixion of Jesus. And these included Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James the Less, uh, and Joseph, and then Salome. Those women are listed along with other women uh, who came with him uh, from Galilee to Jerusalem. Then in uh, chapter 15 and verse 47, you have two of them mentioned, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph. Notice that she is identified in 1540 as the mother of James the Less and Joseph. Now here she's just identified by the one son, Mary the mother of Joseph. And then in 16 and verse 1, you have the women mentioned again. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices. Uh, and so here she is identified by the one brother, James the Less. Uh, in 1547, she's identified by the other son, uh, his, other, his other brother, um, who is Joseph. So you've got these uh, women who are at the crucifixion. They see the burial, and then they come on that morning to anoint the body of Jesus. Now, this Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, should not be confused with Jesus' mother. Uh, Jesus had a younger brother named James, but given the prominence of James in the New Testament church, he would never be called James the Less. Um, this is not the mother of Jesus. Now, she does appear in the resurrect, or rather, in the crucifixion narratives in uh, John chapter 19 and verse 25. John chapter 19 and verse 25. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. So when Jesus' mother is identified, she is identified as his mother, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Uh, this Mary, the wife of Clopas, could be Mary, the mother of James the Less and of Joseph. Um, one cannot be sure. Notice that these three women, all present at the cross, were all named Mary. Uh, Mary is a very common name in first century Judaism, uh, and three of them are mentioned here as being at the cross. And then some of them, at least, to see the burial and then go on Sunday morning to anoint the body and visit the tomb. Now, in John's Gospel, while we're there, you notice that John will focus on Mary Magdalene in um, chapter 20, where he describes Mary Magdalene's going to the tomb, uh, finding it empty, and informing the disciples. And none of the other women appear in John's story. It is as though he shines the spotlight on Mary Magdalene specifically. But I think you can see that there are traces in John's narrative of these other women. Notice uh, verses 2 
and 13 of John chapter 20. Verse 2 says, So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. First person plural. We do not know where they have laid him. Now, you might think, well, maybe this is just the royal we. Uh, it doesn't really mean uh, we as a plurality. But then look at verse 13. In verse 13, she said to them, because, or to Jesus, she said, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. So John knows the difference between we and I, uh, and has Mary on one occasion use the word we, which may be indicative of a wider group of women, such as you have described in the Gospel of Mark and in the other Gospels. Now, one feature of the uh, burial account that is not mentioned by Mark but appears only in the Gospel of Matthew is the setting of a guard at the tomb. In Matthew chapter 27, verses 62 to um, 66, we have this setting of a guard at the tomb. Matthew chapter 27, verses 62 to 66. Next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said when he was still alive, After three days I will rise again. Therefore, order the sepulcher to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell people he has risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the sepulcher secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Now the guard at the tomb is mentioned only in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, it is not in any other Gospel. And one of the principal objections to the historicity of Matthew's story is that the chief priests are represented as knowing Jesus' resurrection appear, uh, predictions that he said, after three days I will rise again. But the resurrection predictions that we have recorded in the Gospels were all given privately to the disciples. And they didn't understand them. So how is it that the chief priests would be aware of these predictions of his resurrection uh, so as to want to take precautions against it? Well, this is an argument from silence. We don't know how they were aware of them. It could be that Judas told them about these predictions when they arranged with Judas to betray Jesus. It is interesting that in John's Gospel, the Jewish authorities were obsessing because Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. And they were seeking not only to kill Jesus, but they were seeking to kill Lazarus. Now, Lazarus wasn't risen from the dead in the proper sense of a resurrection. He wasn't risen to immortality, imperishability, glory, and so forth. But Jesus brought him back to life. He was truly dead, and he was revived and brought back to life. And it could well be that that is what the chief priests and the Pharisees are thinking of when they say the disciples could steal his body and say, like Lazarus, He's risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. So it might well be that this placing of a guard could have been motivated because of this raising of Lazarus and their concern to not allow this same sort of fraud to be perpetrated with regard to Jesus. I think that the guard that Matthew describes is a Roman guard. It has been disputed whether the guard was Jewish or Roman. And I think that the vocabulary that is used here uh, indicates that this is a Roman guard. Why? Because it says that there is a, a Roman, uh, or it says that there is a guard and a kiliarchos, their captain. A kiliarchos is a Roman uh, commander. And so it seems highly likely, I think, 
that this is a Roman guard which is described here. Pilate says, you have a guard, go ahead, take it, and make it as secure as you can. Notice that in Matthew's story, when the guard uh, flee from the tomb after the resurrection, they go to the Jewish authorities because they have been seconded to the Jewish authorities. Pilate has given them over to them. But the Jewish authorities say, if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. Which I think shows the ultimate Roman um, command over these uh, men. Finally, although there is no guard mentioned anywhere else in the um, uh, accounts of the burial, it is interesting that John mentions a Roman guard in connection with the arrest of Jesus. And that is where the word kiliarchos is used. I, I hope I didn't confuse you before. It's in the arrest scene in John chapter uh, 18 where they go to the garden and it's not just Jewish officials but it's a, a Roman guard and kiliarchos or captain of the guard that arrest Jesus in the garden. And so this does give some precedent to the idea that Pilate had seconded Roman soldiers to the Jewish authorities and they were involved in the arrest of Jesus and, uh, at least according to Matthew, were involved in guarding the tomb as well. Well, we've uh, come to the end of our hour and so we will pick up with our discussion next time and continue uh, to talk about the discovery of the empty tomb. Let's close with a word of prayer, shall we? Our Father, as we study these narratives, we pray that you would uh, give us further insight into the course of these events of our Lord's passion and resurrection and uh, thereby help us to be better equipped to understand and to uh, share this faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.